I love the science and cooking course. And in fact, I'm a student in their course uh, when I find the time to actually do the labs and homework and so on. But um, Pia provided one example of the macaroni and cheese to demonstrate viscosity. Uh, another really nice one is the molten chocolate cake example. Now, with molten chocolate cake, uh, the center of the cake needs to be oozy. Uh, so when you cut into it, it just kind of, the, the middle is raw and the outside is, is cooked, um, which is amazing. They're really great dessert. But uh, in order to get that effect, you need to bake it at exactly the right temperature. And so what they do uh, as one of the homework assignments is you create a single batch uh, of batter for, for the cakes and you cook it at different, re at different temperatures and at different times. And so you can see exactly the right temperature to be able to cook the cake to get that oozing center. But what they're doing in their course is similar to what we're doing in ours. We're trying to get people to apply the scientific method, experimentation, uh, not just in the kitchen, but everywhere in, in their lives. And so a few of the examples that we have from science that we can apply um, to cooking is uh, exactly as they are, experimentation. So if you have a recipe, so if you have this cookie recipe, for example, uh, to create the best shortbread, and, and you tweak a whole bunch of things at the same time, so you adjust the recipe, the amount of time that you whip the thing, uh, butter, sugar, or something, and you get this amazing cookie in the end, you won't know which of those things actually did it, or which of those things were actually effective. And you know, if, if you're trying to figure out which of these things work like that, you have to do what Michael and Pia did in their course. You have to systematically, formally adjust one thing, temperature, and see what happens as a result of doing that one thing. So manipulating one variable, uh, variable at a time is really important. Another is careful notes. And so we learned in episode two that memory doesn't work like a videotape. And we're often really, we misestimate how, uh, how well we're going to remember something when we learn it for the first time. And so if you just jot down in, in the recipe, in the margins of the recipe, that uh, something is two tablespoons, for example, if you're not very specific that it's two tablespoons of vanilla, say, then you're not going to remember it a month down the road. And so it's very important to be very specific about what you've done uh, throughout. Um, another is uh, telling other people about it. Once you create this amazing cookie and you've figured out what it was that you needed to tweak to get it there, tell other people. So don't just follow these recipes blindly and just pass them down from generation to generation or um, just keep them within your family. Tell other people because people don't do this very often. People don't manipulate recipes to see what it is that's effective. Um, they just kind of blindly follow what other people have done before them. Yeah, there's a great example. Or there's a great story of this. Uh, a daughter and a mother in the kitchen, they're cooking a roast, you know, it's all prepared and ready to go. And then the mother says, oh, make sure you cut off the ends of the roast before you put it on the baking tray and into the oven. And the daughter says, oh, why do you do that? The mother's like, oh, I think it, uh, it, it helps release the juices, which improves the flavor. And you know, the daughter's not quite convinced. And she says, well, come on, wh why, why do you do that? The mother says, this is the way I've always done it. This is the way my mother, your grandmother taught me. And so the daughter gets on the phone to grandma and says, look, we're making a roast and I'm wondering why you have to cut the ends off the roast before you put it on the baking tray and into the oven. And then grandma's like, I can't, what? I... And then it dawns on her, dear, dear, the reason I cut off the ends of the roast is because it was too big for my baking tray. <laughs> So this is just, it's a simple story, simple example, but it, it gets at that idea of finding things out for yourself firsthand. You could, of course, you could blindly follow uh, what people say and the authority of others. You could be slaves to authority. Or, alternatively, you, could, you can go out and find out for yourself. That's really important to find things out firsthand. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other sorts of cooking myths that propagate exactly like that. Um, I talked about searing meat before. People have the idea that you need to cook a steak, really cook it at a high temperature uh, and only flip it once, for example, to get the outside nice and caramelized and the inside raw. Uh, it captures the juices in more, which is completely, there's, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. In fact, it's the opposite. Uh, which is, another one is um, 
cooking off the alcohol. So if you add some wine to a bolognese or something, the, the alcohol will burn off or yep. something. Or that uh, if you cook food in the microwave, it gets rid of the nutrients. Or if you're cooking um, uh, mussels and they don't open up after you've cooked them, you have to throw those away. I mean, I've seen professional chefs uh, actually propagate these myths. But I don't think it's enough to say that people are silly or people are slaves to authority or that they're gullible or they'll believe anything because we've seen that that, that doesn't quite work. So what we're trying to do is, is, is find out why we make these mistakes. Why do we rely on these, these, these beliefs and these myths and these mistakes and then how we can avoid them and do better. That's right. And this idea, this is kind of a point we've returned that we're returning to now, I think it was in episode two. We're incredible pattern recognition machines. So we provided a bunch of examples where um, we see structure, we see um, signal, we see, we see things that aren't actually necessarily there. Um, if you, if you um, look at a pattern of noise, you see faces in the, in the noise, or in oak, you, know, so you see the word paneling and you can kind of see faces looking at. We do this all of the time. And most of the time, it's normally fine. I mean, it, it's, it's because we do that, because we're so good at that, at seeing faces that, that aren't actually there, um, that we are so impressive in other domains. For example, I mean, we've talked about the availability heuristic, and we rely on the ease of processing uh, to give us some indication about the size of a category. With representativeness, we rely on similarity and familiarity to be able to pigeonhole people in particular ways. And most of the time, it's fine. Most of the time, that serves us extremely well. But sometimes, you know, it's not great. Sometimes we do make mistakes as a result. And at least we need to figure out where those happen and why they happen, exactly as you said. Yeah, so th this, this idea of, uh, of seeing patterns in noise, of, being, of misinterpreting random events, is something that came up in my conversation with Tom Gilovich. So why do we believe these strange things in the absence of, of data or, or evidence to the contrary? Yeah. Um, well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. There's not a, a single answer to this. If there was a single answer to it, we could easily teach that to people in school and then it would be gone, but a whole bunch of things conspire to it. One of them, and most of them, um, are sort of a side effect of this impressive intellectual machinery that we have in our heads. Part of its job is to identify patterns out there. It's hard to get that uh, job accomplished perfectly, so people look out there for patterns and they're often going to see things that uh, really aren't there. And if you go on the internet and type in, you know, illusions, you'll see all sorts of them, people spotting um, faces in clouds or faces in a cinnamon bun or uh, what have you. If you take, for example, grab a bag of M&Ms, pour it in a jar and you look at it um, and they're, the different colors are randomly arranged, they don't look random. It's just like, oh, there's a bunch of blue ones over there and a bunch of green ones over there. We sort of see order uh, where there isn't any. Um, so we can see things happening in three. We organize things into certain clusters that are really the kind of clusters that you'd see by chance. Take, for example, the pretty common belief that things happen in threes. You know, natural disaster. So if, if two of them have happened in close proximity, people will sometimes tell you, oh my God, I wonder what the third one is going to be, or homicides, or a fatality on the part, fatalities on the part of famous people. Um, if you look at all of those things, they don't tend to cluster in threes at all. And so why do people believe those uh, kinds of things? Uh, um, there's a belief in the sports world in something called the Sports Illustrated Jinx. You get your picture on the cover of Sports Illustrated, uh-oh, that's a terrible thing. Your, uh, whatever success got you there is, unlike, is unlikely to continue. That's, a, that's been shown to be false uh, as well. Another belief in the uh, so-called sophomore jinx. You've been exceptional as uh, a first-year performer, a rookie, uh, and the thought is that if you've done really well your first year, um, you're, you're jinxing yourself. Um, or more common kinds of things, you're at uh, a grocery store, you're, the line you're in is really bogged down, going nowhere. There's someone in front of you with a million coupons sifting through them or can't get their change organized. 
and the line right next to you is zipping through. And you're tempted to go to that line. Why stay in this slow one when there's a faster line over there? And many of us often think, oh, wait a minute. I know that if I do that, that line's going to slow down and, and this one's going to speed up. I don't know what principle of the universe would create that. This is a really nice demonstration of what we do as scientists. So if you're looking at this one observation, this little chunk of the world, you can see whether, it, whether it's sufficiently weird, uh, whether it's sufficiently lumpy or fishy, uh, to be able to say that something systematic is happening, something non-random is going on. And so next we're going to talk about uh, the role of chance and randomness and how we perceive these things.